Without black, no color has any depth. But if you mix black with everything, suddenly there's shadow. Not just shadow, but fullness. You've got to be willing to mix black into your palette if you want to create something that's real. As I said, you guys have made it to your lesson seven of your professional diploma in interior design. Are you ready to get practical in this lesson? Let's get practical with some color. Our core learning objectives for today's lesson are to understand the role of color. We're going to get a holistic understanding of the role of color applied to interior design. We're going to look at the psychology around color and color application. A very exciting objective here is understanding rendering. We're going to get into that later towards the end of the lesson. And last but not least, we're going to create our very own hand rendering. So our final objective, an application of rendering. As this is a practical lesson, you are going to need to grab a few things. So as usual, we start off with our sketchbook. I hope that your sketchbook is starting to look really nice and full with all of the challenge work you've been doing throughout this module. Secondly, you're going to need some various pens and pencils, some coloring crayons. And if you've got access to Copic markers, you can grab those. If you don't and you don't know what they are, please don't worry. I'll explain them towards the end of the lesson. Next, you're going to need a floor plan from Sophia's scenario. This will be provided in your summary notes. You're going to need a large surface area where you're able to sit, feel comfortable and draw up some drawings. And last but not least, and you know the drill here, I always say find a nice quiet space so you can feel your creative juices flowing. Let's look at the role of color. We know as designers, one of our core design guidelines is to design around the function and primary use of the space or project that we're working on. As we know, and as we've learned in our principles and elements from lesson four, Color is one of the most important elements to consider when designing an interior space. Not only because it adds aesthetic value to a space, but because it plays a huge role when it comes to the functionality within the space. Why is this, you may ask? Well, we learned about the characteristics of color as a design element. Can any of you tell me why color assists the function of a space? You can pop your answers into your Morpheus text box. If you don't know the answer, you can stay tuned throughout the lesson and we'll see if you can grab the answer towards the end of the lesson. Remember in your lesson four, where we learned about our elements and principles of design, we spoke about the properties that are associated with color. Can any of you remember what these properties were? Let me help you out. Firstly, we had the hue of a color, the saturation and the value of a color. So we start off with hue. Hue is the name of the color. So in simplistic terms, in this instance, our hue would be red. Our saturation means how intense that specific color is. So how vibrant the red is in this color palette in this case. And then we had our value. The value refers to how light or dark the color is. So in simple terms, how much black has been added to that color. So in this example, you can see by adding black to our hue, we've really darkened the red towards the bottom of the color strip. These are just some of the basic terms associated with color and will help you stay on track during this lesson. Obviously, there's so much more to learn about color, but we really need to start somewhere. So in this case, we are starting with our hue, saturation and the value of color. A hue simply means the name of the color. Color is an international language that everyone understands across the globe. This makes color such a great communication tool to use to translate our vision into reality of our projects. To be able to use color with skill and in a way to better our designs, we need to understand the behavior of color and how they influence the mood and feel within each space and each application. As we know, colors have the power to change the character within a space. Not only each different hue, remember guys, a hue was the name of a color, but also when the saturation and value had been altered. So if we'd lightened or darkened a color or added a bit of vibrancy to that specific color. In simple terms, they have a psychological power within a space, depending on which color had been applied to that space and how you as the designer incorporated that color into the design. Firstly, before we tackle each color, we need to know that lightening or darkening a color can also alter the impact within that space. 
A general rule to follow when choosing shades of color to use in your space are as follows. When I say choosing a shade, I refer to lightening or darkening that color. Firstly, light colors are your airy colors and tend to make a room feel lighter and brighter. Think about white versus black. White is fresh and can make a room feel fresh and airy, whereas your black may feel heavy and obviously darken the room. Then we have your darker colors. They are your more sophisticated colors. Dark colors have the power to warm a space and make a room feel very intimate and cozy and comfy. Now that we've just covered the psychological effects to adding light or darker colors to the space, we also need to look at the general behaviors or characteristics of each color type, so each hue. Colors have two behavioral types in general. Firstly, we have your active behavior type and your passive behavior type. So your active colors are commonly associated with traits like strength, confidence, enthusiasm, and exuberance. These colors are vibrant colors and instill a sense of activity within the space. And the colors that we refer to when we speak about active colors are your reds, your yellows, and your greens. Then our second behavioral type is your passive behavior. These are your more neutral and toned down colors. These colors tend to promote mental focus and often have an extremely calming effect within the space. These colors bring about a sense of balance and are often used to offset your active colors. So a great way to use active and passive colors are to use them in, in a combination or in harmony. An environment can become understimulated or overstimulated depending on the quantity of active or passive colors that you've used within that space. This is where your careful planning of your active and passive colors need to be considered. An understimulated environment would showcase colors of weak intensities, which would give a flat, faded feel to your space. An overstimulated space, which means the overuse of active colors, features highly saturated colors, strong contrasts, and complex visual patterns. So let me just recap that for a sec. We look at these examples. Active colors are your vibrant colors, such as your reds, and your passive colors are your pale colors, such as your whites or light blue. The overuse of each of these groups or any of these groups within a space can have opposites effect of what that color was intended to do. So for example, let's look at the red image in your active color area. Everything in this image is red. So we can assume that there's an overuse of red and therefore this is an overstimulated space. Overstimulated, overuse of active colors. If we use too much red in a space, if we overstimulate the space, we're going to have people bouncing off the walls as their minds are going to be overstimulated with the color red. As we know, red is a high intensity, high energy color. So do you guys understand? Can you apply the same principles to the understimulated space? There is so much white in this image, an overuse of white. That means that the space has been understimulated by the use of passive colors. This may lead to the space feeling overly calm and probably borderline, slightly depressive, cold space. Can you guys pick that up in this image? So in essence, a balance of your active and passive colors is ideal within a space. The colors you use in your interior design and decor have an impact on the built environment around you. You need to ensure that you've taken each element of the project brief and surroundings into consideration before you choose your color. So as you can see, there's a lot to consider when choosing a color palette when it comes to the room's main function and what mood you're trying to convey within that particular space. For example, James, our client, has a gym. His gym needs a little bit of a makeover. The function in this case that we need to consider is that the space will be a high energy, busy zone. What colors would you suggest? We know that warm and active colors promote high energy. So in that instance, I would probably suggest using our warm colors sparingly in order not to overstimulate the space, but our warm colors are definitely the color palette that we need to consider. Roughly off the top of my head, we could look at colors such as reds, yellows, oranges. Why? Because we know that these are our warm, active colors. Do you guys remember our scenario, Sophia's apartment from our lesson six? Sophia wanted to create a sense of calm and relaxation within her small industrial loft apartment. We remember that this apartment was located in a very vibrant, busy, bustling city. As her designers, what color behaviors, active or passive, and which tonal variations, light or dark, 
would you consider using in her space? Think back to some of the active and passive examples and light and dark examples I've just given. You can pop your answers into your Morpheus text box. My suggestion here for Sophia would be to make use of a lighter color palette or lighter shades. As we know, the lighter shades will make her space feel bigger and that's exactly what she's asking us to do. When it comes to our active or passive color palette, my suggestion would be to use a passive color palette which would offset her active red within the brickwork in her walls. We know that she's got brickwork because she has an industrial themed or industrial styled apartment. And one of the characteristics, if you remember, is that exposed brickwork is very common. Have a look at the space around you at the moment and see if you can identify any active or passive color palettes within your space. This is quite a fun activity or example to do in your daily life and see if your critical thinking comes into play. Is there an overuse of active colors? Is there an underuse of active colors? Is there an overuse of passive colors and an underuse of passive colors? You can pop your answers into your Morpheus text box or you can take photographs and post them onto your Instagram and then leave little comments in the comment section. Let's explore some of the factors that you as designers need to take into consideration and use as assessment criteria when designing and bringing colors within a space. Firstly, one of the main items and assessment criteria that I always go to is the practical use of color. We need to consider the practical elements within the space. So as an example, if my client had small children or a large sporty family, I would advise to stay away from the overuse of white within the space. Not only because white dirties easily, but also because as we know, it's a passive color. We need a little bit of energy within the space and some vibrant colors in the space. But again, not an overuse of vibrant colors. Secondly, we need to look at the design principles that we want to incorporate within that space. Are you wanting to create a harmonious and relaxing space or a vibrant and dynamic space with pops of emphasis in certain areas? Lastly, we need to consider the mood of the space in relation to the function. So you may want to use uplifting colors in a doctor's reception area, such as yellows and greens, whereas in a beauty salon, I might want to use colors that are more calming, such as my blues and my neutral colors, my more passive colors. The psychology of color is an extremely exciting topic and one that I love. I really enjoy playing with color and seeing the impact that color has within a space. So that being said, let's take a deeper look into the psychology around each color selection and how each of them create a different feel or sensation within the space. In general, color can be divided into three groups. Firstly, we have our warm color group. We then have our cool colors and our neutral colors. So your warm colors generally evoke feelings of passion, as we've learned, energy and vibrancy. These would be your colors such as your reds, yellows, oranges, colors that would give you a feeling of warmth. Then we have our cool colors. These are colors such as your blues, greens and purples. Your cooler colors are associated with calmness, harmony, peace, serenity, but can also be associated with sadness, something to watch out when using too many cool colors within a space. And our third group are our neutral colors. These are colors that generally fade into the background and don't really have a strong psychological impact. For example, if you walked into a white room or a light gray room, you may not feel any specific emotion towards that space. This makes these neutral colors, such as your whites, your beiges, and your grays, ideal for rooms that have many different functions or purposes, or for rooms that just need a little bit of simplicity. Remember, our neutral colors were used in our minimalist style. This really ties into the psychological effect of minimalism and how it creates such a calming and peaceful environment. Let's look back at the psychological value of color from our lesson four in Elements. We looked at red, blue, and yellow. We're going to take this a little further so we get a greater idea of the impact of color within each space and how to apply each of these colors. I'm gonna start off with red. So red is the color that is usually associated with what? Can you guys remember? It's associated with passion and adrenaline. It's known to be able to increase heart rate and some even say it increases metabolism. Red is a warm color as we know, and it's a stimulating and invigorating color, but the color can also shorten tempers and increase irritability. So that goes back to the overuse of a certain color. 
the overuse of red may encourage irritability within the space and that is absolutely not what we want. If we're using darker shades of red, we can make a room feel cozy and lush. The next color we look at is blue. This is a color that speaks to tranquility, calmness and serenity within spaces. It also speaks to clarity and order. The psychological side around blue is that it's said to bring about a feeling of openness and respect. That being said, you could consider using blue in areas or spaces that need to inspire hard work, areas pertaining to health, beauty, office environments, and you could even use these blues in school classrooms. Are you starting to see how color really plays a role in the function of a space? That brings us to our next color. As you know, yellow brings a feeling of vibrancy and happiness. Yellow is a color that is associated with activity, high energy, and high visibility. This color inspires optimism and fosters an upbeat attitude. However, used in excess, as we know, it can tire the eye. Too much yellow can quickly become grating or irritating, much like the color red. So as you can see, an overuse of warm colors can create a sense of irritability. You would typically bring yellow into your interiors when you're trying to lift energy levels within the space, when you're trying to bring about a sense of playfulness and happiness. I generally bring yellows into small elements within homes or in my designs to create happy, welcoming spaces. Next, we look at the color green. How many of you actually like the color green? How do you guys feel when you're surrounded by this color? Can you guys think back, is this a warm or a cool color? Type your answers into your Morpheus text box. Green is a cool color and has the same properties as the color blue, though green is also strongly associated with outdoors and the natural environment. It provides slightly more soothing effects than blue does. Even though green has quite natural effects to it, it is definitely a color to use in moderation as it tends to have slightly depressing side effects. This ties into the fact that it's a cool color and we know that the overuse of cool colors can create a depressing environment. The next set of colors we look at are your neutral colors. Neutral colors are not really specific colors but rather refer to a group of colors. This is one of my favorite color groups as I find a fabulous stepping stone and combining mechanism when adding other colors into your space. Your neutral colors are the colors that are close, as close to white as possible. So for example, this would be your beiges, your light browns, your grays and your creams, and even baby blue. Your neutral colors tend to simply fade into the background and do not have a strong psychological impact within a space. So for example, if you had to walk into a white space or an extremely white room, you may not consciously register the color presence at all. Neutral colors are ideal to add to rooms to balance or break bright or vibrant colors. You could use neutral colors such as your whites or your light grays. These are colors that can carry other colors. So remember that it's a really nice kind of transportation color, if you will. I don't know if you've noticed, but the color black tends to pop up in all the style types that we've covered as it's a very classic color and stands the test of time. Black can be used to dramatize a space as it's a color that stands out against most other colors and is extremely powerful to the eye. And it also creates a mood of refinement and elegance. So that goes back to your warmer colors. Black falls into that spectrum. It's quite a warm, refined color. We've just covered a few of the most important colors when it comes to color application within an interior space. A simple trick going forward when trying to figure out the psychology of the color that you want to put in your space, try and figure out the color category, the color that you're wanting to use fits into. I know a bit of a mouthful, but stay with me. Warm colors, cool colors, or neutral colors. These are the color categories that I'm referring to. This will help you start to figure out the psychological properties with ease. Of course, most rooms are not designed with only one color in mind. This is not the way forward. Your best approach is to choose one feature color and build up with your color palette around that. So for example, your feature color may be yellow and you would use your neutrals as your transporting color to build that up. You can also use your design principles to change the dominance of certain colors. For example, use contrasting colors or use that color as an emphasis color within a space. 
Choosing a color palette or a scheme for a space or project can be an extremely daunting task, even for the most skilled of designers. Even I find it difficult at times, unless I've spent a lot of time investigating the function, the principles, and the outcome that needs to happen within the space. Let's take a look at our client Sophia's industrial apartment as an example. So we know she wanted to create a calming space, but really didn't want to use any color or wanted to use as little color as possible. What would you have done in this instance? What are the color options that are popping to mind? I think another question we need to ask ourselves here is, where do we find the color chart? What is the color chart? What if I told you that there was a tool that made this all just a little bit easier? Well, there is. The secret lies in the color wheel and understanding how to use this color wheel in creating winning color combinations. Well, what is the color wheel, you may ask? It's literally all in the name. It's a wheel of color scientifically set up to guide us in color choices. It's organized in the way that shows you how color naturally combines and blends and contrasts. I'm sure most of you have seen this color wheel before or this chart before, but haven't quite been able to read it or understand it correctly. If that's the case, let's look at how we read our color wheel. So in essence, your color wheel is divided into 12 colors with three main color categories. Firstly, we've got our primary color category. We have our secondary color category and thirdly, our tertiary color category. Our primary color category refers to our red, yellow, and blue. That's it. Primary have three colors, our reds, our yellows, our blue. Our secondary colors are colors that are made up from our primary colors. So colors that are made from our reds, our yellows, and our blues. Our tertiary colors are the colors created from our secondary colors. All the other colors are created from these three color categories. So now we've got a grasp on our color wheel, let's look at how to use it. Here are some color schemes that we're going to look at that have been created from the color wheel. As we dig deeper into our color schemes derived from our color wheel, we come across a color scheme called monochromatic. This simply means one color has been used in varying tones within a space. So if you look at the example, we've got blue as our hue color, we can see the varying tones of this color through the image. So on the left hand side of the image, you can see vibrant darker colors of blue, and then it kind of fades towards the right as we get lighter shades of blue. As you can see under the heading monochromatic color scheme, we've got a blue color palette. This is a perfect indication of how the color blue as a monochromatic scheme moves from light to dark. It shows a great tonal variation. In general, a well-balanced room has both cool tones and warm tones, but not necessarily in equal amounts. So if you have a monochromatic color scheme with only cool tones, you can warm it up a little bit by adding natural tones. So maybe you've got blue artwork, you can use natural fibered rugs to bring in the warm tones within the space. Next, we have the analogous color scheme. This is a color scheme that creates quite a warm feel to a space and adds a lot of interest. It touches on the principles of contrast. This color scheme simply means to pair two or three colors that sit next to each other on your color wheel. Popular colors you could use within the scheme would be purple and blue and green or yellow, blue and green. Think back and think if you'd ever seen an analogous color scheme in an interior. Type your answers into your Morpheus text box. Next, we've got our complementary color scheme. This is a really fun color scheme as it requires some finesse and skill when combining these colors. You know that old saying, opposites attract? Well, this is exactly what complementary colors are and what they do. So complementary colors are the use of opposite colors on a color wheel. So, for example, yellow and purple or orange and blue. Choosing two complementary colors creates an energizing and high contrasting color scheme within the space. So remember that contrasting colors, vibrant and energizing space. I have recently come across a brilliant application called Adobe Color Wheel, which is by Adobe. It's a color wheel app where you and other artists can create and share your color themes and inspirations. It's also a brilliant app in the way that it makes it so easy to put color themes together with ease. It provides you with a color wheel and certain presets for those various color themes. 
So as you can see at the moment, I'm playing around with my analogous color scheme. It only lets me tab within that color scheme. Now I jump to monochromatic and you can see it gives me different shades of that specific color. So I move down to purple and to blue, to green. And at the bottom, it gives us a little color swatch or color bar with the specific colors with each of the color codes related to the, for example, at the moment, the com complementary color scheme. Before we go any further, I want to give you a sneak peek into lesson eight. Here we look at the history of design and we go back into how style has influenced our architecture and design today. So once we've decided on the color scheme and color palette we want to use, we also know what style we're wanting to choose and the principles and elements we're wanting to implement in that style. We then need to look at how to depict our color scheme, styles, principles and elements into our project for our client presentation. There's a simple term that we can use to bring our drawings to life. That term is called rendering. Whether this be by hand or by computer generated drawings, it is still called rendering. The term is referred to as rendering your drawings, bringing your drawings to life. Rendering means to add detail in the form of objects, light, texture and color into your drawings. This will enable the client to get as much of a realistic view of your proposal as possible. We can use our hand sketching skill and ability to create realistic textures and color in our drawing to bring a project to life. Let's look at some of the benefits of hand rendering. Firstly, it makes the drawing look realistic or as much of a realistic view as we possibly can. It depicts the color scheme that the designer is wanting to use. So as you can see in this image, we're seeing a lot of grays and whites. It's a great tool as it depicts texture. So it's really nice because we get a holistic view of what textures are being applied to the project. And lastly, it depicts mood and style. This is a fantastic tool because we, we really want to give the client an idea of what feeling they might achieve within that space or how they may feel standing within that space. Let's take a look at some of the primary examples or the preliminary examples of texture we can use and how to create them to apply realistic renders by hand. So these are your basic ones, your starting textures per se, you can use these to manipulate other textures within your hand rendered drawings. Here you're looking at a timber texture I've created. I've simply taken a brown cokey pen and done light brush strokes of that pen across the little texture block. I've then taken a pencil, just an HB pencil, and I've indicated the notches or the grain of that timber. So it's quite easy. You'll see I've done little squiggly lines and it's, it's as realistic of a timber sample as we can get to by hand. Our next texture type is glass. This is a really fun texture and one that I love doing. I've taken a really light gray or a light blue. I've done light diagonal brush strokes or cokey strokes of that color on that texture block. And then I've taken a light pencil and done little diagonal lines across that in quite um, rapid movements. Then you can take your white gel pen or a pencil crayon to give very rapid strokes, vertical strokes, indicating the sheen and the reflection of light over that glass. The last texture I'm going to show you today is tiling. This is a really fun one. As you can see in this example, I've used to create almost any floor finish with this texture. It's very similar to the way that I've used to depict glass. We've done a light wash of our color over the, the little texture grid. And then again with my white pen, I've taken little diagonal brush strokes to give an idea of the sheen. And then with my pencil crayon, I've divided the texture block up into the size of the tile. So quite simple, quite easy, but very effective. We are now going to use these textures, apply them to a plan to create beautifully rendered floor plans. Let's go back to Sophia's apartment from lesson six. Through some of the research, we found that industrial style would best suit her apartment renovation look and feel. Combined with the color scheme, we are going to use the rendering techniques I showed you above to render her floor plan. Let's take a look at our brief. Our brief is to add color and texture onto Sophia's floor plan so that she is able to see the vision, the feeling and the function that we are proposing within her space. The style that we're using is an industrial style and our color scheme is probably going to be a neutral color scheme. If you guys are wanting to get a copy of Sophia's floor plan, you can find it in your 
summary notes within your course module. Print it off and you can get started. Let's start off by looking at the steps we're going to cover as we start to render our floor plan. Remember, rendering means to bring your drawings to life. We do this by using realistic texture and color applied to our drawings. We start at step one, set up your room. Next, our step two is defining a light source and shadow. Step three, we will add our flooring and any base level. Step four, we will add texture and detail to furniture. Step five is generally adding detail to the drawing. And step six will be filling in and finishing off our drawings. Before we begin, let's make sure that you've got all that you need for this lesson. As we said, you'll need your sketchbooks, various pens and color pencils. You can grab Copic markers if you have them. If you don't have Copic markers, please don't worry. Pencil crayons and Koki pens are more than fun. Make sure that you've printed off your floor plan that we provided. You'll need a large surface area to be able to draw and be comfy. And last but not least, a nice quiet space. We don't want anyone bothering you during your creative moments. Right, so as we know, step one is setting up our drawing. So this step is to familiarize yourself with each room and what color scheme that you're wanting to use and the style that you're wanting to portray in each space. For this example, I'm going to stick with our industrial style and I'm going to use very neutral monochromatic tones as I know and we know it creates a nice calm feeling within the space. This is exactly what Sophia was wanting. Step two is defining our light source and adding our shadow. So here we're going to use our pencil to define a light source. So you can see in the corner I've drawn a little sun that's indicating that the sun will be shining through that window. A classic approach here is to arrange a shadow in a 45 degree angle. So as you can see, I'm taking my ruler and adding little 45 degree angles to all my objects. This is indicating where the shadow will lie. I then take my Copic pencil and do light brush strokes along all the shadowed areas. Every time I take my Copic and go over the same color, it makes it a little bit darker. So you can vary your dark or light areas of shadow. So I carry on until I've added the shadow all across my drawing. Step three is to add our floor and floor detailing. I've chosen to do this as a combination of tiling and timber in light browns. Before I started, I drew up a few faint lines with my pencil to indicate my flooring timber panels. I've done this very lightly though, not too hard. And then I started adding Copic marker strokes all along the page, as you can see. Once you've done your Copic markers, you can then retrace your timber panels with your pencil and then add the little uh, timber grain and detailing with your pencil as I showed you in your textures sample. Once you've done that, you can then go over again in maybe a different brown or a darker brown just to add a little bit of detail and finesse within the space. Our step four is to add texture and color to our furniture items. So I've started by adding the glass to my coffee table. You can add your timber and your tiling to your tiling areas. You can add the texture within these spaces. Use the techniques and samples that we learned about above. Obviously, there are many variety of textures that you can use to create, and you're welcome to get creative with any textures you may like to use. As you can see, I've created a marble countertop that I've used from the sample that we looked at for glass, because marble would have been similar or have a similar reflection to glass. And I manipulated it to look like a marble or charcoal top. I'm then doing little spotty lines or little rough strokes as a carpet to indicate the textile on the carpet within the bedroom and the lounge area. Next is our step five. You can start adding your detail here. So I've used a white uh, pencil crayon and a black fine liner, but you could use a white gel pen, which is probably better, or a white pencil or a white fine liner or black fine liner. The white pencil you would use to show light, so don't be scared, you can draw straight over your drawing. As the sunlight comes in, take your white pencil over your 45 degree angle and just wash it over in white. I've then taken my black fine liner and just add a little bit of detail where I feel the area should be darker. And finally, we get to our last step, number six, fill in your walls and finish off your drawing. So here I've taken a black cookie pen. You can use a pencil crayon or any black marker of sorts 
and shade in all the walls of your floor plan. You can see I've done this in the example on your screen. You can finish off by adding the name to the bottom of your drawing as we always do. And there you have it, your very own hand rendered floor plan. These almost become like a little art piece or little artworks for your portfolio. They're great drawings. They give a great visual representation of your project. I still use these drawings for my clients today. They love them. So hand rendering is definitely something that is coming back into the design industry and becoming extremely popular. It's not something that everyone can do. We are very aware of that. But if you do have this talent or you're willing to practice this and develop the skill, it's definitely something that you're going to use in your interior design career. That brings us to our challenge for today's lesson. Take your floor plan from lesson two and try apply the rendering techniques that you've learned about in this lesson. 